training algorithms to recognize deep fakes. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Christy Sisson, Professor and Director of Photographic Sciences at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Welcome, Christy. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Give us a brief summary of your photographic science and IT background. So my background um, is actually specifically as an ophthalmic imager. So that's imaging of the eye and for the eye uh, in the medical environment. And so that was my um, sort of professional background before I joined the faculty here at RIT. And now I'm part of the photographic sciences department where we teach students both photography for the sciences and the science of photography. And the information technology is incorporated into kind of every aspect of imaging these days. And so I have my hands in a lot of the uh, technology, the delivery systems um, and things like that, that uh, we use images for. You recently published an article about deep fakes, the federal government, and playing that role of, in your words, uh, the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Give us the backstory on the project. Sure. So our role for the project was to um, create this massive data set of manipulations, image manipulations, video manipulations. And the purpose of that was to generate this whole set of, of sort of faked, fake imagery so that the folks who create the detection method, so the software that actually determines whether or not something has been faked, could sort of be challenged by um, these manipulations that they didn't know what had been done to them. Um, and so a part of the overarching sort of goal of this project was to ultimately create a tool that can be used by whomever government law enforcement agencies to detect, number one, whether or not an image has been manipulated, and number two, how it's been manipulated. And so by doing that, um, um, our role in that was really to perfect as much as possible those algorithms of detection by challenging them, by continuously sort of coming up with different ways to fake an image, to fake a video. Um, that includes both sort of manual manipulation, sort of good old fashioned by hand, pixel by pixel, as well as manipulating the data under the hood, the metadata in an image or video or media file. Um, and as well as so artificially, artificial intelligence um, sort of created manipulation. So to throw sort of everything that we could think of at these methods of detection to really strengthen them. You wrote that you found that the key element of the battle between truth and propaganda actually has nothing to do with technology. I explain your finding. So it's, it actually has more to do with a kind of an observation that I had. So all, as we're sort of in the midst of this project, so it was a three-year project that we embarked on, and, and about midway through, we, you, know, you couldn't help but notice all of this, this imagery in the news that was making news and was being um, sort of disseminated that was really, it was, was manipulated, very obviously manipulated, and done very poorly, you know, from certainly from, from my perspective. And it was a surprise to see the uh, sort of buy-in of that imagery, um, as well as the dissemination of it. And so it's sort of, I, as a, as a, somebody with a background in technology, you know, and, and being, being asked to generate the, this data set on behalf of this project, it never really occurred to me that, that there could be this other piece to this that, real, that couldn't be solved necessarily by technology, that had much more to do with human behavior and why we share images and, and um, why you know, why would we, why would anybody share an image that is so clearly uh, fake or so clearly manipulated? And so it sort of, it, it, it was a personal shift for me um, to sort of recognize the problem as a much broader problem. And a lot of that is context specific. You know, there's a big, big difference between images that are shared, that are shared in a court of law or by a government organization versus images that are spread on Twitter. There, there, there's definitely a difference in context there. But, but that being said, there's, 
there's a component to this that has a lot more to do with psychology and sociology of which neither of those I am an expert on. Um, but that was a, that was a surprise to me. What are some examples of some well-produced deep fakes that you've come across? Well, so our job was not to analyze deep fakes that other people have generated. So our job was to try and replicate things that have been seen, that have been recognized either by the government or through social media. And so we were inspired in a way by those um, sort of fakes to recreate um, sort of the conditions under which they were created, but sort of chronicling what all those conditions were. So taking that scientific approach of, you know, being able to work backwards through that image, know exactly what we did, when we did it, how we captured it, with what sensor we captured it with. Um, so that from that scientific perspective, walking through that manipulation in reverse, we could then sort of see how those algorithms of detection did. So our, our job was not really to analyze sort of in a, in a deep way what sort of fakes were kind of coming out, but we were definitely inspired in <laughs> by, by things that we saw in, in the media and um, sort of concerns of national security and sort of concerns of security um, that we tried to replicate. Well, since you did um, drill down on these, let's let's talk about what goes into making a deep fake. What kind of clues should people look for even when trying to decide what is real and what is fake? So I think that first and foremost, context is extremely important. Um, knowing where that image or video came from, uh, how it sort of came to be in front of you, that's really important for anybody to understand. And I think it's sort of the first step that anybody should take to determine if they can sort of trust the image or the video that they see. So that I think is far more important than any um, sort of technical indication or, or any clues that might be in the image or in in the video because you know for a long time uh, you know for as long as photography has been around we've relied on experts to be able to say oh yes this image has been manipulated the problem we have now is that the images that that we're sort of inundated with on a daily basis um, are at such a you know, a high volume and a high rate higher than, than we've ever sort of experienced in human history. And so it's just not possible for a human expert to um, really evaluate those image by image. And so that's why we, we really do need that technology to be able to rely on to, to help us sort of filter that. But getting back to sort of what you can do on an individual basis, I think that, that doing that very simply, reverse image search, you know, in, in Google search, just do the image search, you know, click on the little camera icon and the ne in, next to the, the Google search bar and take a screenshot of that image and see if you can sort of chronicle by just doing that simple search, the provenance of that image, where it came from. And in some cases you can even determine that it has been manipulated and how it's been manipulated. You can sometimes come across sort of articles or, or you know, sort of debunking websites, things like that, that you can sort of help to so inform you as you decide what you're going to do next or, you know, before you hit share or before you, you know, reshare. And that's especially true over social media. Google recently released a data set of 3,000 deepfake videos to help researchers. How how do you expect those videos to, to to be used? Well, any like like any sort of technology, we have this sort of constantly evolving, moving target as to what constitutes what these what what the data is that is that makes up these images and these videos. And so, having um, sort of a a massive or a, a fairly large repository of a certain image type is incredibly helpful to strengthen um, these algorithms of detection. And but what I what I add to that is that this is in my in my mind a constantly moving target. That this has to be done often, you know, to be able to and with different modalities, with different approaches, so that as to exhaust those capa those uh, those possibilities to strengthen that detection, because 
new sensors come out, new cameras come out, every, all of these look different fundamentally from a technical perspective. And so understanding really what that means and the impact that it has on these different methods that this, this method may be foolproof today, but a new sensor comes out and it has a completely different compression. It has a completely different sort of organization of the pixels for lack of a better term. And it, that changes the dynamic of what those methods look for. And so the, the generation of these kinds of data sets are hugely important and, important and definitely should continue. Thanks again for joining us, Christy Sisson, Professor and Director of Phot Photographic Sciences at the Rochester Institute of Technology. If somebody wants to connect with you, Christy, maybe they've got some questions about your work or just trying to understand deepfakes, how can they do that? Um, I'm uh, on LinkedIn, so you're, it's more than welcome um, you contacting me through LinkedIn. Sounds good. Thanks again, Christy. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.